Here we are. <laughs> Welcome back. Um, I'm Joyce Maynard, and I took it upon myself as the senior member of this panel. Um, I don't think anybody besides Judy Bloom probably has been publishing um, uh, as long as I have, 50 years, um, to introduce, um, or to actually ask my fellow panelists to introduce themselves. And then we're going to talk about um, the question that's on everybody's mind, what women want. <laughs> um, yes. Um, I hope we can enlighten you a little bit. <laughs> um, I'm Jamie Quattro. I am the author of a story collection called I Want to Show You More and a novel called Fire Sermon, which is the most recent book. Um, I am Lisa Tadeo, and I am the author of Three Women, which was nonfiction, and my most recent is Animal, which is fiction. And um, I'm Joyce Maynard. I go back and forth between fiction and nonfiction. My most recent um, book is a novel called Count the Ways. Um, but I'm a huge fan of the genre of memoir, too. And it's always storytelling, right? Mm -hmm. So um, there are women in our books. What do they want? Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> a multiplicity of things. Yeah. But I don't, you want to kick it Listen off? carefully, men. Take, take notes. <laughs> Um, do you want to do you want to take that one, Lisa? Oh, um, yeah. Well, uh, uh, you've sure. been interviewing. You should, <laughs> uh, actually, Lisa, uh, Lisa, you should describe uh, for those who don't know Three Women, which I'm reading right now and is gripping, um, yeah. what you spent, I think, a decade doing. I did because it really was germane to this question. Okay, I will. Um, so, uh, Three Women, I um, I interviewed hundreds of women across uh, America, but I landed on these three specific women, hence the title of the book. Um, spoiler alert, it's about three women. Uh, one of them uh, was a young woman in Fargo, North Dakota, who um, allegedly had a relationship with her high school English teacher when she was underage and he was married with children. Uh, second woman, Lena, was a is a housewife in rural Indiana who um, when I met her in a discussion group that I started out there, um, after moving there semi-randomly because I had heard the Kinsey Institute was in Indiana, and I'm like, oh, I'm writing a book about sex. I'll just move to Indiana because I didn't, I didn't know where to start. A hotbed of sex, <laughs> exactly. as we all know. It actually was. Um, uh, Lena, uh, when I met her, uh, one of the first things she said in this group was that her husband no longer wanted to kiss her on the mouth and said that the very sensation disgusted him. Um, and all Lena wanted in terms of, of women, of what women want was to be kissed. She was after a kiss. That was all, the last thing she had had in high school that had made her feel seen and alive. Um, and all she wanted to do was, was kiss a man the way that, uh, um, Wesley kisses Buttercup in The Princess Bride, which I thought was just magical. Uh, and the third woman, Sloane, uh, who I lived um, near in, um, in Newport, Rhode Island, uh, she, her husband liked to watch her sleep with other men in front of him. And she was sort of trying to figure out where her desire ended and hers, where his desire ended rather, and, and hers began. Um, my most recent novel, mm -hmm. Count the Ways, follows one couple um, through uh, their uncoupling, yeah. actually, from when they fall in love uh, and decide to make a family, which is another thing that many of us want, uh, the, the dream of a family, mm -hmm. which sometimes is very different from the reality, um, over the course of the next four decades, um, through the raising of their children, the gradual death of their marriage and follows them on beyond. Um, and, you know, we were, um, Judy and Jamie, for those who were here for the last great panel, were talking about sex. And, of course, sex is, is the most obvious desire. Mm -hmm. um, but desire, mm -hmm. as we know, takes many forms. Um, um, Jericho sp spoke of the desire for cuddling. Yeah. Um, there is the desire for love. Um, I think one of the desires that I would list high up is to be known. Mm -hmm. um, in the book that I published right before Count the Ways, which was a nonfiction, a memoir um, about finding and then losing my very good second husband over the course of just four and a half years mm -hmm. in my late 50s, um, I, 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 this memory just came to me, he, one of the very last things he said 
before he died when a friend came to, to see us and he, he could barely speak. But she said, how are you doing, Jim? And he said, I'm doing great. I have been known. Um, and I think that's a key, that's a key element in, that, that informs my writing, the desire to be known, to tell the truth, and to, we, in so many places in our lives, we conceal who we are. We are afraid to say who we are, and the consequences are high of doing it. Mm -hmm. But you, you addressed, um, you address in, in, in your work, the things that people don't talk about, which I think is one of the gifts of a book, to, to get to hear about what we don't hear about. Yeah, I, yes, I completely agree. And I think, that, um, I think that for women specifically, it's really difficult to, to say those things. Um, and I think it's often, and I was talking with Jamie about this the other day, I think it's often the fear of what other women think uh, that is the most, um, I think, you know, with the Me Too movement and stuff, uh, women, especially younger women, have been getting really great at telling men what they no longer want. Um, but I think that a sort of inverse thing has been happening whenever there's a movement, a sweeping movement in one direction. It's like, oh, okay, we don't want this, we don't want this, but we all must want this in order to move forward. And I think that's really inhibiting. And I think that we kind of keep ourselves as a, as a gender collectively in a sort of jail of, you know, we have to all feel the same thing in order to ascend. We cannot ascend if we are different, if we're disparate people all going together. So I think it's important to say those those things that are often, you know, the kind of like creepy thoughts that we have in the back of our minds that I think men have been feeling more free to say for centuries, perhaps a little less free now. There's a little bit of an inversion. What do you think about that? Yeah, I, I was going to say that I think w what you're saying about women speaking forward their desires, and it's often those desires are transgressive. And mm -hmm. I, I do write about transgressive sex in my work. I write about illicit affairs. And there's something kind of strange that seems to happen, and part of the pa this panel title is fictional, or real life characters and their fictional counterparts, and when a, as a woman, and I don't know if you've both experienced this, writing about sexuality, frank, transgressive, illicit, whatever, often people will say, how autobiographical is that? Mm -hmm. How does your husband feel about your work? which is kind of a leading question for, like, did you actually do this? Is your character a stand-in for you? And it, it kind of infuriates me, because I think if I was a man, and I'd written about illicit sex, and I was up here, you know, and that was a question, I don't think people would say, how does your wife feel um, about your work? So I don't know, how, how do you both think about the gendered kind of nature of assuming that a character, naming oh. her desires, is <laughs> the author? <laughs> you know, I've been... And another hat that I wear is that I, I teach writing. I've, for 25 years, I have worked um, only as a teacher of memoir and almost exclusively with women, um, although every now and then a man gets into a workshop of mine. And it is a striking phenomenon that men don't have this issue of worrying about mm -hmm. what people will think. Mm -hmm. But women, um, of, certainly of my generation, and you two are significantly younger, but I think it was still true for yours, um, are, are raised to think about everybody else before themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and that's actually a big part of the story of the character in my novel, that mm -hmm. she would have a hard time saying what she wants. Um, mm -hmm. I don't... I, 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 I think many... Any man who's at this festival, I'm going to say, is, is likely to be a good man. So this, you're <laughs> off the hook. But, but it is a, a much more rare phenomenon for a, a man to be thinking about what everybody else wants right, right, first. Right. Um, I, this, in my character in, in Count the Ways um, is raising children. And although she is the breadwinner of the family, um, her husband has a kind of freedom. And of course, mm -hmm. this is also, it's now it would be called historical. She's raising her children in the 80s, as was I. Um, and, uh, you know, try now today as a young husband, father, to speak of taking care of your children as babysitting the children. But men in that era did, including one I happened to be married to, um, <laughs> past tense. Um, but he, he goes off 
running, cross-country skiing, playing on his team, one of the things he does. And she says, when does it get to be my turn? And he says to her, you wouldn't know what to do <gasps> if you had a free morning. Oh. And the sad truth is he was right because I think so many women have been so in, indoctrinated mm -hmm. to not recognize their wants that the first step is, is the very simple primitive one of being able to say what you want. Yeah. You might not know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, Lisa, I want to also ask you some questions about Animal because you moved from writing nonfiction into writing a novel and, uh, you know, this, this question of characters being stand-ins mm -hmm. for, how, have you, how has that been for you with the publication of Animal? I think that, you know, I had written, um, I had been writing uh, short stories for a while and also, um, you know, the requisite several novels that I had not shown to anybody. So, and I've always been uh, writing fiction. So, but because Three Women was the first thing, the first book that I published, you know, it was like, oh, journalist, Lisa, and I'm like, oh, journalist is a strong word for me. <laughs> I just wrote this book. But, um, but when I, when Animal came out, there were people were kind of like, well, how did you do, what, what, who's Animal, what, what is that, like, you know, where did that yeah. come from? And it's like, well, I think, and Joyce, you writing, you know, both fiction and non as well, it's, it's the idea that um, I think people like, and I specifically with women, once again, I'm not trying to like beat that, that drum, but it's kind of true. Um, you know, it's like, oh, well, this is your box. This is what you do, you know, and this is mm -hmm. what, uh, so you're doing this. Why, why did you decide to do that? Like we were just talking about Joyce is going to see some Bob Dylan paintings, right? And we're like, well, what? You know, people don't go, oh, Bob Dylan. I mean, we, we actually kind of did. I, in my head, I'm like, oh, he gets to paint too. But <laughs> for the most part, it's like, no, Bob Dylan can do whatever. But so I think, I think it's always, sometimes I, I felt the need in questions about animal to address them like where I had gotten certain parts of this person. Like, oh, well, this came from me, but this came from this lady here. And the need to sort of assign a value, um, uh, like a, a mathematical value of how something had been arrived at mm -hmm. in order for people to, to, to just like be able to write it off in their head as, oh, okay, that's, it's, that's legal. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, exactly. <laughs> um, I think it, it's interesting that, that you speak, Jamie, of people drawing, uh, trying to read into your fiction mm -hmm. what part might be your life. Mm -hmm. And right. that's happened to me certainly a lot. It's happened most of all in the new novel, which mm -hmm. it, on the surface, the character's life bears certain very obvious similarities to my own. Mm -hmm. and, and, then, and part of what's interesting is to then begin with the known and then do all the things right. exactly. with your characters right. that you haven't. But, but I could say whether it's fiction or memoir, that we always write out of our obsessions, Absolutely. which I think is another name for yes. desire. When I teach, yep. one of the first things that I ask my students to do is to make a list of their obsessions. Cool. Because it will, and, and you might say, why do I need to write down my obsessions? They, they're my obsessions. I know them all too well. I wish I could be free of them a little bit. But, but to the act of writing them mm -hmm. down, I'm sure there are writers under this tent for whom I will say, that will inform your writing. Mm -hmm. That will be mm -hmm. the engine totally. to attach to your work. Absolutely. And whether you're reading my novels or my memoir, if you, I don't recommend this, that you sit down and read you know, all 20 in one, in one swoop, but if you were to do this, you would know my obsessions right, right. pretty darn well, as much from my fiction as from my nonfiction. And mm -hmm. always, and those don't change. The characters change, the stories, the situations. Mm -hmm. It could be animal, it could be women in, you know, women in Indiana, but always underlying it. I can name mine, both large and small, you know. Yeah. Love, family, home, and then Dolly Parton. She's an exception. <laughs> She's in just about every novel I've ever I, have, I you just, met, have you met her? I have. Oh. I have. Oh. I have ridden on her bus um, years really? and years ago, but she dedicated Jolene to me one time. Oh, um, wow. But, <laughs> and, and the useful thing about that obsessions list, and I'll use Dolly as a very good example, mm -hmm. 
is that not simply to sort of name it, but then say, why is that? Why am I obsessed with that? What is it about Dolly Parton that speaks to me, that, yeah. that touches a nerve in me? And I actually know very well. Yeah. It, nobody would like automatically think, oh, Joyce Maynard, Dolly Parton. Yeah, yeah. naturally. But I know the parts that yeah. are that Tennessee mountain home girl and yeah. the coat of many colors girl wow. that, and the I will always love you girl. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so important for the writers here when you, you know, when you have that list of obsessions to just go for it. What Judy Bloom said earlier: get rid of the critic on the one shoulder, and and the uh, was it the mother on the other shoulder or the the censor on the other shoulder? Um, death to the writing. Death, right. And one mm -hmm. of my mentors, Jill McCorkle, used to say, lock mama in the closet. <laughs> she heard, you know, Southern, I'm also Southern, living in the South now, have been for 17 years, and there's. A culture down there, right? A religious culture, and I'm kind of coming from that culture and within that culture. And um, Jill tells the story of how people would meet. You know, what do you think of your daughter's books? And she'd say, Well, you ain't gonna find them in the Christian bookstore. <laughs> <laughs> Bless so, her heart. <laughs> she's like, Lock mama in that closet. <laughs> Bless her little heart. Lock her in the closet. <laughs> but um, yes, yes. If you're if you're going to be writing about obsessions, they're scary sometimes. What we're obsessed with and. Oftentimes, they're not things we're going to act on in our real life. And that energy is so propulsive. And if we resist it, you know, and acting on, maybe I'm, maybe I'm obsessed. You know, one of your obsessions is, like, what would sex be like with someone else? Certainly one of the obsessions of my characters. If I was exploring that in real life, that obsession, I think that energy would drain. But that in resisting, sometimes yeah. exploring some obsessions could be harmful. And taking it to the art and taking it to the page, there's, there's so much energy. I think Judy Bloom called it angst, and I agree with that. It's if if you're not going to places that are scary, yes. I'm going to say, then you're not doing your job. Right. It is if it's too comfortable, if it doesn't leave you on edge, mm -hmm. it's it's not going to take the reader to a pl place of discovery. Right. Um, my my line that's kind of the equivalent of of Jill's is write as if you're an orphan. Oh, um, that's great. And I happen to be an orphan, and I've been an orphan for a very long time. But, Me too. Uh, Me too. <laughs> But, which probably has, you know, it was really hard in my life, but it was, it was, it was useful. But whether or not you are an orphan, um, you cannot, it is death to the work to be thinking about whoever that, yeah. that arbiter is. You know, for me, um, you know, my most notorious book definitely was my memoir, At Home in the World, mm -hmm. um, in which I told the story of a very young relationship, now 50 years ago when I was 18, um, with a very famous, revered writer, J.D. Salinger, who sought me out. Um, and after he sent me away, I could not tell that story for 25 years because he sat on my shoulder. That's a, oh, that's wow. a long shadow. And a have. writer sitting on a writer's shoulder uh -huh. is yeah. one of the worst mm -hmm. um, people. But, <laughs> you know, if not in inside a book, where? Where do we get to experience yeah. total freedom? Totally. And, um, as it's a really good as point. costly as it may be, I mm -hmm. I recommend that for the for the writers out here. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I always say to students is, you know, you begin with your character. Who, well, if it's memoir, is you. Mm -hmm. If it's a person in a novel, it's your character that you've created. And then you give your character a desire. Mm -hmm. Desire is propels everything. Mm -hmm. Desire makes us do what we do. Right. Or we crush our desires, and then we get into trouble for doing right. that, too. Amy Humble used to say, make sure you know what does your character want and what is your character willing to do to get it, which gives your character agency. Yeah. Um, oftentimes, students will have, they absolutely know what their character will want, and then their character just sort of sits there and wants it, and everybody else acts <laughs> around them. You know, you have these inactive characters. Yeah. Well, it helps to give your character a problem. Too. Yes, a problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in and an Animal, she, I, you know, on the can we talk about a little bit of the plot that she wants to find this specific person out in California and it's it's a, a crazy obsession <laughs> like <laughs> well I think one of the things I've always been um, interested in is the obsession that we have with um, with other women and I think that um, I was doing you know Emily Ratajkowski came out with her book My Body yeah. and I did a, a talk with her and she, and one of the things that's in her book is um, 
the idea of uh, her, you know, she's one of the most beautiful women, right, that, that's alive today. And she was saying how her boyfriend, now husband, was uh, talking about another woman and saying she's so hot or something, or so she's beautiful. Not, not, it wasn't the terror, it was just like she's, he was just remarking on another woman's attraction. And she said that her stomach started roiling and she just like lost it. Mm. And, it's, and then she went and just became obsessed with this woman that he had just said a couple of things about or whatever. And I thought it was so powerful. And the way that she described it and the way that she's honest about it um, is, is so powerful to me, that obsession with other women. And in Animal, the, um, the main character, Joan, is uh, driving cross country to find a woman from her past who kind of holds the the key to it. But this woman happens to be very stunning and beautiful. And Joan, the main character, who is going through a sort of like not feeling great about herself, becomes obsessed with her and and her beauty. And and it really is kind of always mirrored back at oneself, that female-on-female obsession. The same thing with with heterosexual um, female-male obsession. But... Um, Jamie, what I wanted to ask you, um, not, not, well, not so much uh, just to discuss, because I loved, one of my favorite parts of um, Fire Sermon is the epistolary mm-hmm. stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, there's the two characters, Maggie and mm-hmm. Jane, mm-hmm. James, um, are, are writing to each other. It starts out with writing to writers, writing to each other. And it's so... It, that that's sort of the way that you crystallize that it, it's it's just such a perfect um uh it's so perfectly calibrated the way that it happens those like early the early obsession with mm-hmm. someone never really looks like obsession right right it looks like kindness and i think that's so intriguing um and i just I just, I guess, well, and that's what Lauren was talking about in her keynote, the idea of the anticipation being the thing that is always bigger. Right. Um, and, and I think that so much desire for women lives in that, you know. And then once we get what we wanted, we're kind of like, oh, that wasn't, yeah. that wasn't that great. Yeah. But those letters, that stuff like, like, you know, the first kiss, those things, and perhaps it's because we've been conditioned to like the romance of things right. by our, you know, movies and whatever. But I still find that so compelling, and I love writing and talking about that. That's sort of the, the and that's what a book is, the, like you were saying, Joyce, the unmet the things that we, you know, that we haven't, but it's just exciting to be, if not in a book, where else? Right. Which I think is amazing. Yes. To me, the the almost erotic or the almost yes. consummation. Exactly. It's so much more. And Lauren said this last night. It's so in my first book, I, I kept, I didn't let them have sex. There's there's a series of linked stories, like six of them in the collection, where they have this distance emotional affair, but there's no consummation. And uh, after it was published and came out, you know, this almost eroticism, this kind of tension there, uh, my husband, who's sitting here, actually was the one who said, why don't you, why don't you just let your characters, the F word, I can't remember my <laughs> good religious conservative upbringing that I had, <laughs> why don't you let your characters fuck, there, I'll make myself say it. And so I kind of want to <laughs> push and lean, lean into that and explore it, but even when I had that as my charge, like allow my characters to do something that I wouldn't necessarily do, I found writing sex or allowing characters to do that so, di- so it, that isn't interesting. Unless, unless the sex is about something mm-hmm. other than sex, yep. sex is not interesting. Sex mm-hmm. has to be a conversation. It has, to, it has to be a discourse. It has mm-hmm. to be an asking and a receiving or a, some kind of a, a give and take back mm-hmm. and forth. But the actual mechanics and how it happens and how your body feels, to me, that is the least interesting 100%. part. Well, yes. I think part of what's interesting is that in that act, because it is so literally naked, Mm -hmm. um, we learn other things about a person. That's right. Um, Jamie was describing a scene in a novel of hers in which the man is looking at himself in the mirror. Mm -hmm. That's actually, we're learning something not about the sex, we're learning something about the man. And the theater in which it's played out is that one. But but there are others. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, want to acknowledge I uh, my novel to die for, um, which involves a, a wildly ambitious woman who wants to be on TV. That's her desire, okay. um, and she sees her very sweet but conventional uh, husband as holding her back, um, and she enlists her 15-year-old lover to 
kill her husband. It's not a book about sex. Okay. Um, it's um, it's it, it's a rare example, incidentally, of a of a book whose movie adaptation I think was was right up with the book. And I you know normally that doesn't die happen. For I do it. love that. Uh, um, but there is ambition, but it's played against, it's played in the theater of sex. Mm -hmm. But she's completely manipulating this boy who's a 15 year old virgin and he's on a drug which happens to be sex. She's on the drug of ambition, which mm -hmm. is another powerful yeah. desire, as is money. Yeah. And uh, performance. I, I love that you're bringing up the theater of sex and the performativity mm -hmm. of sex. Lisa, you really get into. Um, desire and sexuality as the performance of desire and the performance of sexuality. There's so often that Joan will be about to enact something and then she'll pull into herself and mm -hmm. think, I like think about myself and what I'm looking mm -hmm. like hearing this right now. Yeah. Can we talk a little bit about um, how women express desire through performance of desire and, or yeah. men too and why, why perform performativity is a part of that? I think that when, um, that when a woman is not really into um, the, the sex she's having, and not because she doesn't, let's say, it's not even because she doesn't like the person or find him attractive, but she just might have, she might have nervousness about what the future of it, et cetera, or maybe she's just completely unattracted. One of the things that or when I was... she's unattracted to herself. Exactly. She's uncomfortable exactly. in her own body, exactly. which I think is a huge one. Exactly. Right, right. Um, but I think... When, when women are, when we are comfortable in our bodies, then there's an idea of performing for the person we are with so that we can continue to feel good about the way that, so it's not like we're doing it for the man, we're doing it for ourselves, but the man is the theater of it mm -hmm. in that moment. That's right. Um, or the woman, you know, if you're, it, it just the idea of whoever it is it, it, we're kind of like, we're just, it, it's almost that person is a mirror. Mm -hmm. um, and if you don't feel great looking in the mirror, you're going to try to do other things. Like, you know, like my daughter said to me the other day, I was looking at myself in the mirror and I was like pouting. She's like, why do you always do this? And I was like, oh God, I don't know. <laughs> oh my God. Um, oh man, but... the kids will catch you every time, won't they? <laughs> yeah, oh God, they really just cut into the heart. Oh my God, I remember the day my 15 year old son looked at me and his face just fell and he's like, you have gray hair right here, mom. I was like, oh, thank you. Thank Thanks. You. <laughs> it's because of you, but thank you. Exactly. You gave them all to me. <laughs> oh my goodness. I, I, would, I think this also translates to um, this, at least in my novel, with illicit desire and wanting mm -hmm. to have an affair with someone, you actually are, is it really that person or is it the person you would be yes. with that, the version of yourself mm -hmm. that you could be with that person is actually what's so attractive and maybe not that person. Yes. Um, and I think Joan experiences that and I'm certain that you've written about that too. The, the falling in love with this version of yourself. Yeah. And even the whole concept of an illicit desire is sort of interesting. What, what is illicit? What, more, yeah. what should we not be allowed to desire? Right. It doesn't mean we act on it. Right. It does it, but um, the moment you start judging somebody's desires, I'll, <laughs> for some reason this memory comes to me. When I was in marriage counseling in the last throes of the marriage that I was mentioning before, um, and I was writing books and paying the bills and taking care of the children and driving them to their games. And I was working really, really hard. And my husband was an artist and was working hard in his way. Um, but I was certainly burnt out. Mm -hmm. I was um, 34 years old and I had three children under the age of um, seven. Oh. And um, the, ther the therapist said to me, Joyce, the therapist who I'm sure had a crush on my husband. It was kind of plain. Um, oh, God. And um, she said to me, Joyce, what do you want? What is your fantasy? And I, this very hardworking woman who got up every morning at four to write her books before the kids woke up and, um, and drove to all the games and contributed to all the bake sales, I said, I took a deep breath and I said, Sometimes I just want to throw my ice skates in the back, another obsession on my obsession list, I want to throw my ice skates in the back of the car and drive to Lake Placid and study figure skating. It wasn't oh. like a big sex thing. It was just, and she said to me, Joyce, 
you're a mother of three young children. That is very irresponsible. <gasps> oh, no. <laughs> I have never forgotten it. Needless to say, I didn't go back to that therapist. But, but we, you know, when we start judging oh. our desires right, or right. judging somebody else's yeah. desires, That's right. um, therein lies trouble. I absolutely agree. That's and and my novel approaches it from religion, so my character is deeply religious, and so there's this religious stricture against yeah. sex outside of marriage, sex before marriage, all of that. So she's pushing against and within and through these religious strictures, which is why I use the word illicit. But yeah, take that scaffolding off of yeah. it, and yeah, there's what, what's illicit. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think we were getting a, a, a signal that we could that we could open this up to questions, which is always my favorite moment. Mm-hmm. And we've been kind of starved for this sort of event. I'll just yes. speak for myself. Absolutely. But, so we really want to hear from you. Please don't be shy. There's no such thing as a bad question. <laughs> In my case, there's no such thing as an embarrassing question. Mm-hmm. I've just don't ask, what does your husband think about your novel? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can ask him. <laughs> you can solve that by not having a husband. <laughs> but there are other ways. You could just have oh, a good no. one. <laughs> okay, yeah. Please stand to ask your question and wait for a microphone to come to you. And I love to hear the person's first name. Hi, I'm Kristen. Kristen, hi. Hi, Kristen. Uh, This is really kind of for all three of you, I think, but um, when you kind of first have the seed of an idea, how do you decide if you're going to go into the fiction world or the memoir world? Hmm. Good question. Hmm. Really good question. I I usually, uh, the idea, the idea already will define it. If, If there is an experience that I have lived through, um, no, actually, I can't say that because the most recent novel explores things I have lived through, marriage, raising children, divorce, children after divorce, growing older. Um, I think I want to... The, the power of the memoir is that it, it's, it, it stays strictly to what happened. And, the pow- and, and I think for you, the reader, part of its power is the unblinking honesty of it. And that is, my, that is my pact with you, the reader. It doesn't mean I say everything that happened. That would be bad memoir. But, but what I say is true, and I don't shy away from the truth. I don't say, ooh, that's too uncomfortable. I won't, I'll, I'll mm-hmm. step around that one. Mm-hmm. Um, if I want to go to a place that I don't yet know, that I have not lived, I will take those same themes and obsessions as I did with the most recent novel. But I'll imagine what didn't happen that I maybe wish had happened. Sometimes I've, I've conjured up a man in a, uh, in a novel that I just wanted to be with. And I, every, there's nothing better, no better way to get yourself to the laptop every morning five <laughs> and to just know there's this really fascinating, sexy guy yeah. who may be an escaped convict on the run, even though that's who it was <laughs> in Liberty, um, that, um, that I want to spend my day with. Right, right. That's great. I can't answer that question. I haven't written memoir, but I'll just say that as a fiction writer, I feel that what I'm doing is taking my life, so small, lowercase truths about myself and my life, and then translating them into a big lie, like a much larger lie, that ultimately, I hope, will reveal the largest truths, the capital mm-hmm. T truths. Um, and, and I would think that memoir in any form of writing, I would, I would hope that that's at least part of the process to reach that sort of unassailable beautiful and true thing that reaches across, you know, all genders and um, nationalities and all of that. So (laughs) if that doesn't intimidate you away from your laptop, (laughs) but yeah. No, I think that those two answers together are absolutely perfect and exactly the way that I feel. Um, The only thing I would add as an answer to the question is that I, I don't think there's a wrong path. I don't think that an idea is either fiction or nonfiction. I think you can do whatever with anything. Um, I think that's true of almost anything. It can be a song, it can be whatever. As long as it starts with a passion or an obsession, I think you can put it in any sort of form that you want. Mm -hmm. And the work will tell you, I will say, I think I do believe that a work comes to an artist and says, here I am. 
will you enflesh me? Mm -hmm. will, you, will you give me birth too. to me? Mm -hmm. And that it knows what it wants to be. And if you listen sentence by sentence and let the sounds carry you, it will tell you what it, what it wants to be and what it is. Do we have, a, we have one up front here. Since you are going to begin your story with a protagonist and his or her obsession, um, do you always sort of know as you are shaping this book how it's going to end? I personally never know how something's going to end. I've never plotted anything in my life, much to the chagrin of my editor and everyone that I've ever worked with. Um, and I always, I, this might be the first time I've ever said that out loud and honestly to anybody. <laughs> um, but for me, much as Joyce was talking about uh, coming to the laptop every morning because there's like a sexy guy that you want to hang out with, um, for me, if I know what's going to happen, I get incredibly bored. And, and like I want, like, like, like Jamie was saying, the story to sort of speak to me. So I literally go sentence by sentence. What I start out with and, and the thing that tells me whether or not I'm going to finish something is whether the voice is real and, and is like just whether the voice I'm speaking through, whether it's third person or first person, whether it's fiction or non, if it's real and honest and true, um, that's, that's what I, I don't know what the end is going to be. I only know who the person is and I want them to tell me the crazy stuff they're going to do. I, I have a bit of a different answer. I've often had last lines and first lines. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if I, if I know my very last line of a short story or I've written poetry or, or a novel, in fact, the novel I'm working on right now, I do know the last line. I have no idea how I'm going to get there yet. And I want the work to surprise me, because if I'm not surprised in writing it, you won't be surprised reading it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's really true that what Donald Barthelme said in his wonderful essay, Not Knowing, that it's, it's imperative to not know too much mm -hmm. in order to be able to write it organically. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I have, I have known the ending, but I do, I want to be, not the ending, but the last beat. Like, I, I want that when I know I'm done is I want that Yeatsian sound of a box clicking shut. So for mm -hmm. me, it's a bit of a sound game when I know I'm done. It's just, does it mm -hmm. have the right cadence? Does it have the mm -hmm. right feel? Which is a really amorphous way to answer that. What about you? I'll say, and I don't, there is not, um, um, it's a wonderful question, first of all, and there is no one right answer. And I've, mm -hmm. I've heard so many writers say radically different things. I know John Irving always has the last sentence. I never do. Um, and in most cases, I've been as close to, in this most recent novel, I think I was 20 pages away from what I knew would be the ending. I knew where the ending was going to take place, and I knew who the characters were that con were converging on this space, and I had no idea how it was going to end. Luckily, this wasn't my first rodeo, and so I felt very secure that it would come to me, and there would be, that the excitement that I would feel discovering it I'm my first reader. I write something that I want to read, and mm -hmm. so I, I, mm -hmm. I write it fast, usually, because I can't wait to see how it'll end. What I do know is who my characters are, and they bring me to the action. It is, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I've, I've, I've worked with people in workshops who sort of say, you know, oh, I'll figure out her backstory later, or, um, well, I'm not sure if he's gay or straight, or how can you write a character and not know certain basic things about who they are that will determine the story? And I don't, I don't think that's going to work. So I put them in action. I always say that I, I, I think of myself like, you know the, the original Pinocchio movie um, where Geppetto, the, the puppet maker, makes this little wooden puppet of, of Pinocchio. Um, this is kind of metaphoric for parenthood, I think. We make this little person and we think for about one minute or ten that we are going to control what that child does, but the child has ideas of his or her or their own. And you set them in motion. Mm -hmm. And then, instead of you leading them, they're leading you. Mm -hmm. And that's what my yes, characters yes. do. Mm -hmm. Beautifully said. And I did find the ending. I, I found exactly what needed to happen. And that has happened just, I think, every single time. 
That's encouraging because yeah. every, with every book, I'm like, nope, nope, not going to happen. I'm done. I'm washed up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a writer anymore. So I think I know what women want. <laughs> Tell us. I'm sure you're a popular guy. <laughs> I think women want romance. Romance. And I'm surprised. Maybe I missed it, but I don't think any of you used that word today. Ah. And, I think when she and, said being and our, known. And our speaker this morning mentioned cuddling after the sex act, as if cuddling is at least as important, because it's romantic. And my observation is most women use sex to get romance, as opposed to men, most of whom use romance to get sex. Hmm. Well, first of all, I'd say this is, this is generational. I, I actually always like to know somebody's name for some reason. What's your name? Jay. 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 Um, I would say that was, the, that was the story when we're probably roughly the same age. Um, speaking as a person who went back to college as an undergraduate at age 65, I can tell you romance is not high on the list anymore. And there, is, it, there has been a clear mm -hmm. dif differentiation between sex and romance. Mm -hmm. And romance is something that I, I don't ever want to generalize. When I was very young, I sort of launched my career making vast statements about my generation. I don't make them about my generation or certainly the younger one now, but that's not necessarily the case. You are speaking to somebody who makes sure that she's always got a good supply of candles, you know, in her closet. But, and, and music is romance, food is romance. Those, those things, we, we fill our scenes with those things if, as, as a part of the experience of what we desire. But, but um, I'm gonna say that was a little bit the old story that, you know, men just want the, the physical experience and women are just kind of mushy. Women want the physical experience too. Mm -hmm. Amen. Do you like romance, Lisa? Like, I don't, I'm super not it. Like, my, my, I, he knows not to like buy me flowers and do that kind of thing. I just, I'm not in, into like the romantic gesture. I mean, I think, I think the word romance is very, um, it's both loaded and also kind of doesn't really, it means so it many means different things, right. kind of. Yeah. Um, I think that, I, I think, and Jay, correct me if I'm wrong, um, that men and women both like romance equally. Um, I, I think that it's just that romance for, for both parties, both genders, um, all genders, at different times becomes something we're afraid to want. Because I am now equating romance to the stuff that is not sex. And I think for younger generations, it's easier, it's easier for young women to to talk about sex than it is for them to talk about love, the same way that it's always been easier for men to do the same. Mm -hmm. I think that because love slash romance brings in stuff that, there's a real rejection there. It's, it's worse than a bodily rejection. If somebody doesn't love you or want to do something romantic for you, it, it's a re that's the kind of rejection that the unrequited love rejection, which I think is something that men can suffer from even more acutely than women in some cases. I think unrequited love drives so many men. It's what's created so many of men's best books have come from unrequited love. I think James Salter, you know, that's one of his obsessions. And I think that, um, I think that, uh, you know, I think, yes, it's changed. Joyce, I definitely think it's changed from what I've seen. Um, I think it's changed because women have been able to be more honest about wanting the physical as mm -hmm. when they're younger. But I also think that, you know, I think that when, when men are truly in love, that they can be, um, that they can be as sort of splayed out by romance as they are by, by sex. It just kind of depends on who you're talking to and what stage of their life they're at. I also want to say that I think romance takes many forms. And there, is the, there are the sort of cliche romantic gestures like candles, music, flowers, um, diamonds, chocolates. Um, and don't get me wrong, I'm happy to receive those. But um, it can be, I 
the man who accompanied me to this festival, the day that we left, made sure that the air was put in the tires of my car. That's, That's romantic. Hot. That <laughs> it was pretty hot. And what was less hot was that we missed our plane because of it. But oh. and we're a day late. But I, I, you know, I'm not noticing. I'm not carrying that grudge. We got here. But but that's romantic. In it, I'll go back to my most recent novel that about a, a couple who are having problems. But one of the problems is they don't speak the, each other's love yeah. language. Mm -hmm. The husband at one point um, replasters the walls in their bedroom very beautifully, and for their anniversary. And when she walks into that room, and there is no bouquet of roses, mm -hmm. and there is no piece of jewelry or great lingerie. She feels that he has failed. Yeah. But that plastering, I'm not going to say that a vacuum cleaner is ever a romantic gift. <laughs> I've received one of those too, and it wasn't so great. But, or it was actually a pressure cooker. But, but it is, it is what, what is really romantic, what is at the core of romance is recognizing the desires yeah. of the partner. And right. whatever that desire is, yes. honoring yeah. that. Well, I think it goes back to the being known. Yes. Yes, yeah. exactly. I think that's the most romantic. I think we had somebody over here who had a question. Speak to how our various desires change as we age. So I'm 50. And um, so I feel that I 